But first, it's been more than 20 years since director Robert Altman's film, M.A.S.H., reinvented black comedy for Americans hungry to laugh at convention. Since then, he's brought us the cult films McCabe and Mrs. Miller, Nashville, and now The Player, the picture that reveals both the inner lives of Hollywood and possibly its director as well. Robert Altman's movies are wry and telling and always unpredictable, and we're pleased to welcome him to our broadcast tonight. Welcome. Pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Uh, are you surprised about the attention that the player <laughs> continues to generate? Yes, I'm very surprised. I mean, I thought the movie stopped you know, yes. when, when we put up the end title, but it's still it's yeah. going on. Yeah. When, they, when you first got, saw the script and, and you wanted to make it, and they'd already gone through ten directors that turned it down, a few, a few, uh, which is a little sort of changing notion in your life, and MASH had gone through a bunch of people before they yeah, got to yeah. you, too. Sidney Lumet, I guess, is one, or maybe one or, one or two others. I don't know who all, uh, Sidney was involved in the player at, uh, a while, and uh, I think they had budget problems. Yeah. <clears throat> but... Um, when you saw it, did you say this is a movie made for Robert Altman? No, but it's quoted that I said that. But I, I didn't say that. I said, I said I know this arena, and I can. Uh, this is a film I can make, and I'd like to make it. So. Yeah. Why would you want to make it? Oh, I don't know. I just I like the. I saw the way that I could structure it, which, which uh, actually it has the same ending as Mash. Yeah. Which uh, I don't know if you remember, but in Mash at the end, where they came on the loudspeaker and they said tonight's movie. Yeah. will be mash and so it and it kind of turns the film turns into itself and the player uh, l to me looked like I had a chance that I could make sort of an essay yeah. uh, about the the business that I'm in it, it became it turned it's a film about itself now, were you in part though itself. saying the, some of the same things about Hollywood that mash said about war uh, well I maybe the, I was, I think that the people say this is a satire and it's an attack on Hollywood. It isn't. It's uh, I'm using Hollywood and the film business as a metaphor for the our culture and the country. Yeah. Uh, Saying what? It metaphor for what? Talking about greed and uh, the, the the way the, who we admire. We admire. We teach our children to admire people who make money, and it doesn't make any difference how they make it. Yeah. And the, 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 the quality, in other words, we've changed our standards over the last 30 years, I guess, to, set, to a point where, uh, you know, unless they get put in jail, these guys that make these billions of dollars and slick deals, uh, we, they're our heroes. And uh, the film business is, the, the business of the film business is run the same way because it's a big crapshoot. Mm. There are those who think this is Altman's revenge, too. Well, I don't care what they think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't know what. I think they're getting their revenge. Yeah, but <laughs> How so? But uh, well, uh, the, the very fact that, they, that they've now embraced this, this movie, which appears to be an attack on, on yeah. uh, our own industry. It isn't, though. It's, uh, it's just using things that we all know and yeah. trying to show the, the amorality of it. And, but you're also saying, I'm a part of this system, aren't oh, you? Oh, absolutely. You're saying, this is me as well. Absolutely. There's not one... I, you can't, I can't do a satire about anything unless I'm at the core of it. Because otherwise, I would, I'm, it's propaganda. I mean, I have to know, I know what selling out is. <laughs> I mean, You've done that, have you? I'm invited quite often, and <laughs> occasionally I go. <laughs> when was the last time you went? Oh, just about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Coming here to do this show, and they say, "Well, you know, this will this will help you in uh, in all of these uh, post post year uh, awards, awards and all that, and all that kind of thing." <clears throat> so here I am, yeah. sold out. I thought you came here because it was a great respect and love you had <laughs> for television and for this program. <laughs> well, I, I <laughs> silly a, I was. I've got a show coming on on, on PBS, uh, Black and Blue, that I'm yeah. very proud of. I did uh, for uh, last year the, uh, the the Broadway Review, and. Um, so we'll say I'm promoting that. All right, we'll talk about that. <laughs> it also says something about what happens to originality, doesn't it? This notion that, that, that the player does in terms of, of what happens, how the system sort of chokes off Well, the system creativity. That, that we talk about, the system mainly that controls the, the, most of the money that's involved in fi yeah. filmmaking is, is mar marketing. How do we sell this stuff? They're trying to sell something. They don't much care what it is they sell. Yeah. As, as long as they can sell it. 
Uh, I, I saw an article today where Tom Cruise kind of jumped on somebody because they, some critic had said that Far and Away was a, was a, was a failure. Right. And he says it made $136 million, and you can't call that a failure. So he judged it by how much money it made rather Abs than the quality of the film. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is the problem that we have in, in, in the houses we build and the, the, uh, the art that we do and the suits that we make. And I read somewhere you said, I've ne I like all the films I've made. That's true. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> in the first place, film, making a film is a collaborative art. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, I have a bunch of collaborators. I am one of the collaborators. So uh, we start out with an idea, and the idea is, is we're going to make this film, and it's a it's a really a lot of work. It's a lot of work, takes a lot of time and a lot of of, of energy and concentration. And every film that I've made, at the end, I said this is the film that we set out to make. Every one of them. Every one of them. I've, I've had I have one film I have misgivings about, and that's a film I did a section of for uh, several directors, did a little section that was given to someone else, and then they put it together. And I, I was uh, very unhappy about that. Then, and you judge them to be good or not good? Even if you, I, I you don't set them, out to make a bad <clears throat> film, so therefore oh, if you no, made the film does. that you like, you think it's a good film. I set out to make a film, yes, th th that film, this film. This is what we set out to make, and in, in every case, each one of these films is like a child. I mean, uh, it's there. When it's finished, it's cut loose. The cord is cut, and it has its own life, and I can look at these films, uh, and um, I, I love all of them. And I'll sit down tonight if somebody walked in and said, gee, I, didn't, never, I never saw Brewster McCloud. I said, haven't you? And I said, uh, I got just happen to have one and over if, here. If somebody would sit and look at it, I'll sit down and look at it with them. And with pride. Well, I'm seeing a new film through their eyes. I see. So how they react to it says yeah, something else yeah. to you. And, and uh, it's the only, I can, I wouldn't, you could put me on the island with, with all these films and I'd never look at one of them if yeah. I was alone. If you had to pick up all the films you've made and somebody said, you got one last film to show, Altman. Which one are you going to go pick? Oh, I don't know. It depends on who I'm talking to. It would. You depend on who, what you think, what? Well, if, 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 I, if you were posing this question to me, yeah. and I sensed that you didn't, uh, that probably you thought Quintet was my worst film. <laughs> You'd show me Quintet. I would say that's what I would show. <laughs> you, you are what they say about you. No, no, that's true, because <laughs> it, they're, all, they're all separate things. They're, they really are like your children. They're, they're, I've got six children and, <laughs> and X number of and, grandchildren and, and X number of great grandchildren. Two great grandchildren. <laughs> three great grandchildren. And uh, they're all different and I love every one of them for their own particular yeah. reasons. And also they, you can't change yeah. them. They're, 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 they're in existence. And, and the fact that one does at school better at school than others, or one is well liked by his colleagues more than the others, or one it, is more popular makes nothing, no, makes no difference no, to you. No. Let me just go back to the player for a second. You opened this film uh, with an eight minute no cut sequence, mm -hmm. and this camera rolls around. You shot how many? 10, 15 takes? Ten, 15, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, but, all, but most of them were good takes. You just happened to select the one we that you We had five used. printed takes. Five of them were acceptable. Why'd you do that? Why just one long <clears> cut? <throat> well, in the first place, I have to open the picture some way. Right. So, and what I want to do when I open the film is show, is introduce everybody to who the participants, who the players are, right. uh, what the film's about, what the arena is. So I show this movie studio, and I show many people in and out. I show uh, people making pitches to Griffin Mill, the, the Tim Robbins character. And at the same time, I've got guys going through this scene say, talking about long takes talking about Orson Welles, uh, various. So, so I'm, as I'm showing you this film, which is my introduction, at the same time, I'm making fun of myself yeah. uh, or of filmmaking at, at the same time. So I'm, I'm accomplishing about three or four different things. Introducing characters, making fun of yourself. And tell, telling you what the rules are of this film, that yeah. this film is going to be that way. We've got a clip that doesn't show all of the eight minutes, but a little bit of the sense of what this film is about. The player will be nominated for lots of awards. It's already won some awards that are the L.A. film critics or well, the New, New York, York, New York, York film, film critics. critics. We were, we were a runner-up in L.A. All right. Roll tape. Here it is. The player. Who did you work with? What's yeah. interesting about this thing we were watching is Buck Henry, you have, you talk about collaboration, you have these actors that were known, these celebrities that appeared, Burt Reynolds and the rest of them, create their own dialogue. Sure, I had to. I, I, when I call, if I called yeah. you up and I yeah. say, you want to come and be in my, I want you to be right. in my film, 
Charlie, and you come to me and you say, well, now what do I say? I yeah. said, you're, you're representing yourself. Yes. You're I can't, playing yourself. I can't tell you what to do. Yeah. Uh, I can't tell Burt Reynolds. Uh, <laughs> uh, I said, you've got to be responsible for yourself. So everything, that was all Burt's idea. Yeah. Well, Burt says, that's all or something, doesn't yes. he? Yes. Right. Well, he said, that's what I would, I said, you're in a restaurant. This guy's going to come up. He's going to introduce himself to you. He's one of those studio executives. Yeah. You can choose to know him or not know him. He says, oh, they're all assholes. <laughs> and I said, well, you want to say that? He says, yeah, I'm going to call him an asshole. I said, fine. And we shot. <laughs> and what did, what did, uh, who was with him, Bert? I forgot who was. Charles Champlin. Champlin was with yeah. him yeah. in that scene. Yeah. And he was interviewing him. Why did all these people come to do this? You didn't pay, you paid them what scale, and they had donated yeah. the money to charity in most of it them. It all went to the motion picture home. I think the reason that they, uh, they did it uh, I think the reason they did it is that they wanted to raise their hand and be counted. I think it was almost a political statement. They knew what yeah. kind of film it was. They knew what the what we were trying to say about greed and and um, uh, I think they just they said, yeah, I like do, that. Do I want to be in on it. Do you think they maybe were saying Altman is going to snub his nose at the system and this is a chance for us to play in the game? I think they wanted. to I think they wanted to be counted. Now, did you get some came to you after the fact that said, how come I wasn't asked to be many, in this? Many, many, many. Like whom? Uh, Warren well, Beatty. Well, Warren, Warren is the case I don't want to discuss. <laughs> okay, well, you know why you don't He did to... come afterwards, but he also, uh, we had conversations well, with now, him. Well, he claims he never heard from you. I know. Uh, <laughs> why don't you want to discuss it? Well, because I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to get into a, a oh, why not? battle with Warren. Uh, Meryl Street said, why didn't you call me? Why didn't you call me? Yeah. Well, we called... I called most of, many of these people I didn't know, I had no yeah. previous experience with. I called them as it occurred to me. They added what to the film? They added, the, the first reason they were there is that they added a, uh, they qualified the film, a legitimacy. Right. You walk into a restaurant and there's Martin Mull is sitting there or yeah. uh, Brad Davis was in that or scene. Or party Jack Nichols. I mean, uh, Jack, uh, Jack, Jack Lemon is at a piano. Uh, they're there, and you say, "Oh, that's that's what it would be like at one of those parties. These these are the real people." It's the, the idea came from the Tanner '88 series I did uh, when we ran uh, the candidate for president. Well, you mix reality because Tanner in that in, in that HBO series would interplay with with real living people. politicians, yeah. and, and we would just walk into the arena and uh, turn the camera on. And uh, you said you couldn't make the player without having made Tanner. No, I, I, it never would have occurred to me to do this. I mean, after doing Tanner, I realized that we can do this crossing reality with fiction. And um, we kind of learned how to do it. And I said, well, this will work yeah. with this uh, Hollywood picture as well. Has it turned things around for you? Oh, yes and no. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's been successful. So that's helped a, a great deal. Uh, it suddenly... Uh, made me acceptable in, in the Hollywood establishment, but then I don't work for them anyway, so that doesn't really mean anything. You don't work for them because they don't offer you jobs, because you don't fit in their I structure. I don't think most of the, I don't, the pictures that they want, would want me to do, I don't know how to make. And the pictures that I want to make, they don't know how to market. You went, having made a, grown up in Kansas City, right? Yeah. Uh, World War II, yeah. uh, came out of World War II, went to Hollywood, then didn't quite work out that whatever you wanted to do didn't happen, then started making industrial films. Yeah. And, from, and from that went to make um, television, episodic Lots directing, television, episodic films, yeah. Alfred Hitchcock, Bonanza, and the rest of them. Mm -hmm. Then MASH comes along. Um, what did that do? I mean, it just opened all well, the Ma doors? Oh, yeah. MASH opened the floodgate. I mean, I was a fair-haired boy. Uh, uh, the people were embarrassed because they hadn't heard of me. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you've been rocking around, and, for and it, Mash gave me a big, big ticket for uh, oh many years. The Cabin, uh, Mrs. Miller, Brewster McCloud, uh, Nashville images, and I went yeah. on and did many, many pictures, and then Nashville again. Then they, I did about five films at Fox that that sort of failed, but they were good films. Didn't make any money, is that they their, their make, definition? McCabe of failure? and Mrs. Miller was one of the lowest grossing films ever, ever put out there. <laughs> Pauline Kael did all that she could to make it work. Well, uh, but now it's considered like, they talk about it like it's some monster picture. And, yeah. uh, uh, Is classic. it? Classic. It's, it's a good film. Now, there you saw one of the things that you began to hear. People would come out of that film and say, I couldn't quite hear it. What were they saying? And there was the overlapping <clears throat> dialogue in that film, which became a kind of 
Alton well, trademark. Well, I get a lot of credit for, for that, but uh, you stole go, it. go look at some Howard Hawks <laughs> films and you'll see the same thing. I mean, it's nothing new. Who's taught you the most about directing? The, uh, just just doing it, just getting into the, yeah. here I am, here's, here's who's in the room. Does that make do you it. different than Scorsese and all those guys who went to film school and, and uh, no, no, the no. rest it, of them who've had a lot of training in? Well, I think Scorsese's uh, background and mine are probably pretty comparable. He yeah. was an editor, he's yeah. uh, done different things. Whether you go How to film Spielberg, school. Spielberg, for example? Well, Spielberg's a little different. He's, he's, he works. Um, but it's basically all the same. My my film school, there, there weren't film schools when I was in, in that uh, era, but uh, was was working in these industrial films. I mean, I had to edit the film, sell it, shoot. I had to know, I had to know everything. Yeah. So I learned all the tools. What, there's a body of work you have. Uh, is it, you know, what is, what's an Altman film? Well, I don't know, but I think most uh, of artists, uh, all their work is their work, and and I I feel that all of my all the work is is one b body of work, and it's starting to merge together for me now uh, in my own. When I look at, you know, I've got a new film I'm editing right now. Shortcut. Yeah, and I look at it and I'm I'm very pleased with it, and it's. Um, I think what did I see so much familiar stuff? Well, of course it's familiar to me because it's all, it's everything that I've done, and yeah. and uh, so the experience has taught you what works for you. Yeah, my son, I have a son, I have several of them. But my, uh, Steve, my, who's the uh, production designer, is an art director uh, on the player and many other of my films, and he he can talk. We can sit down at the family dinner table and we can carry on a conversation just using dialogue from my films because these kids remember all of the lines. <laughs> yes. From, uh, and so do you. Well, I, when they're call, recalled, yeah. <laughs> I remember them. In 19, after making Nashville and all those films, you had those few that didn't make a lot of money for Fox, and then you made Popeye. Yeah. Which, in their judgment, was a disaster. Well, that was in the public judgment at the time. Popeye was a, is a was very, very... Made some money, didn't oh, it? Oh, sure. And it's a very successful film. It's probably one of the most successful videos right now, and it will be because it's a great babysitter. And because Robin Williams is a big star? Well, that has not a lot to do with it. Robin, uh, the, um, Robin was great in the film, and uh, he certainly uh, helps it now, but it's it's... There's a new generation of kids. Every six years, there's these new kids, yeah. and, they, and they all... And Popeye's fly. like Superman. He lives forever. In a yeah, sense. and Superman was the problem. That was the hair and the butter. Uh, <laughs> yes. When Popeye was finished, it wasn't a hard action picture like Superman, and it didn't do the Superman grosses. And they were Disney and uh, Paramount were very disappointed. That was the standard it. that they measured it by. Yeah. yeah. And they, they started the uh, Barry Diller, who was... Then the uh, head of um, Paramount, Paramount uh, was bad-mouthing the film to critics even, and people before it came out, he said, oh, this is no good. Even though it was his film? Mm -hmm. How do you know that? From talking to the people. Yeah. Have it's you like, ever confronted him about it? Yeah. And what does he say? Uh, he said, well, I, I don't think I said that. I mean, whatever, it doesn't make any yeah. difference. I mean, I'm not singling Barry Diller out, uh, uh, but th these guys, th th this business, they look at these these products that they come up and they bet on them, and this comes up and they said this is going to dwindle out, so they're through with it. Yeah. And and they did it wasn't supported. But uh, Popeye's not a. The press thinks of it more as a failure than uh, than people who have seen yeah, it. Yeah. But after you made it, you well, left town. You sold Liongate. Well, was it Lionsgate? I, Lionsgate. Lionsgate. I sold I sold that company I had, but I I sold the company because uh, it was taking too much of my time and energy. And I was, I mean, uh, you, you either run a business or you, or you make movies. And As I, Francis Ford Coppola and others have found out. Yeah, it's very tough. And so I said, I'm going to get out of this. And I came back to New York uh, and uh, started doing little theater. This is 80. Yeah, yeah about around 80. 81. But then you went to live in Paris. Then I went to Paris and I made a couple of films. You stayed away there. most of the 80s, did you? Yeah, know? I was in Paris. Made Theo and... and Vincent, uh, and, Vincent Teo, and Teo, I made Teo Beyond made, Therapy. Yeah, Tanner in 88. Tanner, I came back in Court Martial, uh, came, came in, in Court, Court Martial was television, that was for CBS. And, but then you wanted to get back in. Well, you always, I'm always wanted to get, I mean, I always wanted to make uh, films. I never was out, I was never took these roads on, 
on purpose. But you weren't beaten on the door during that time. There's almost a sense that you, while you were during the 80s when you were doing all this other stuff, you weren't being offered anything. But well, I've never offered very much. <laughs> <laughs> There's an interesting idea you have about your work, which is that you, you're always scrambling. I mean, there's never been a time, you're 60, what, 67? Yeah. yeah. You're always scrambling, you're always behind the eight ball in your own mind. Yes. I'm, 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 I hear those wolves snapping at my ass <laughs> as I cross across those, the ice flow. <laughs> but those and you can't look back because they may get you. Like, but uh, uh, no, I just, I like to work and uh, I mean, I, it's the only time I'm really happy and that's yeah. when I have fun and, and so, uh, so I have to keep setting projects up and they, and they really, to make them work well, they have to be my own projects. Yeah. I, I don't How much of casting is a director's work? Well, it's a great deal of mine. I think that by the time I've finished casting a, a project, about 90% of my creative work's finished. Because what, you let them go then, well, and, no, and you, if you they choose have, the good ones, they'll know what to do? Well, they have the ball. I mean, they, they have to interpret this stuff. They're the ones that get up and do it. These are the people you see. They're the ones that give them, deliver the message. And what are you looking for in those that you choose? I'm looking for actors who I have a sense can fill this part and bring something into it that is that it never occurred to me. I think that if, if every film I thought of, if 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 what was in my mind, if that all came out on the screen, it would probably be a terribly boring film. Yeah. But the minute these actors come in and take take those roles and they in, invest them with something that I've never seen before, ideas, thoughts, and I see them come to life as real people. I, am, I have got to be in a state of surprise all the time. Mm -hmm. If I'm surprised and thrilled by what I see, then I have to assume that you're going to be. And what can you do to produce that, if anything? Uh, to give them the encouragement and the freedom uh, and force them to to, to to not be inhibited, but to go ahead and do that, and and uh, I don't control them. You've said that when you what you look for in actors is you need to see something going on. Yeah. What does I've that got, mean? I've got to see that that's a real person there. That's not just somebody standing there saying lines. I don't think the lines have any are particularly important. I don't think it makes a lot of difference. Most of the the dialogue that we use in conversation. Are in our living is is uh, is covering things up. It's hiding things. It's uh, it's uh, doing everything, but except we're self-editing all mind. the time. Oh, constantly. Yeah. And you look for actors who are not doing that and uh, who are loosened who, from that censorship. Who are uh, actors who know what the job is and what their art is, so that they put themselves out there. These are very very noble people. Uh, they stand out there and take their clothes off, if you will, and stand there and say, "This is me." And they're out there naked, yeah. and uh, it isn't easy. I can't do it. I couldn't do it. You can't do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. John I don't even H understand how they. Could John do it. Houston could do it. John Houston was a fair actor, but but John Houston <laughs> was not a. I mean, John was a good friend of mine. John was a, a good actor, but he was not better than most directors. Yeah, but he's like Orson. He was a like different Orson kind Will. of actor. Yeah. He's a different kind of actor, and. Um, I just, I can't do it. I mean, what, you don't have what? I don't, my mind goes blank. I don't have every, any understanding of how uh, the minute I think that a camera's looking at me or, and I'm supposed to do something, I, I'm so worried about, uh, am I going to do it properly? That uh, I'm doing it, my face is a little flushed from the inside anyway right now because of this discussion. I'm just not good at it. And I don't understand how anybody else can do it. So when I see Tim Robbins or I see uh, Peter Gallagher or uh, these actors that I've been working with, Buck Henry, uh, come in and play these roles, and I look at what they're doing, and I think, my God, where, did, where is this coming from? How can they do this? I mean, I stand in awe of that. And, but you've never wanted to do it. Because, oh, no. no, and, no. And, and what is it you think they have learned? <clears throat> oh, I don't know. I, it think, it's, I think it's some sort of... Uh, it's like being a, throwing a baseball or catching a football. Yeah. I can't do either of those things either. <laughs> but it's a learned trait, acting. No, I think it's a, it's, it's a, I think it's a talent. You do? Yeah. Something you're born with. Like music, well, like, I think it's something like that you, James Levine, who's coming up, clearly was born with musical talent. Yes.
That's and 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 I am clearly not. <laughs> uh, but you were born with what talent then? Oh, I think uh, I have learned um, the ability to to see what other people can do, and I can I, I can translate that somehow, mm. or I can get them to do it. I can convince them that it's okay for them to be honest. Could you have made the work that you have accomplished? Could you have done all this you have done without having been at odds with the system, without having been a maverick? Suppose they had come to you and said, Altman, here's the money you need. Go make the films you want to make. We're not going to bother you. Everything will be I, great. I don't have any if idea. If they'd given you freedom. I don't know. You don't I know. No, I have no idea. I, I think that had I had to always make successful films, I would have failed. By their definition or by yours? Mine, by, by my yours. own. If I had felt that I have to, this has to work uh, commercially, this has to work for a certain group, or, or I would fail, I would fail. Uh, I, I, my position in, in all this is I think I just have to keep doing what I do. And the more of it I do, the better I become at it because it's, I'm getting experience and practice. You, you don't, though, if I read you, hate the studio system. Oh, well, I don't... It, you just don't admire I don't hate it. it. No, no, I just I don't think it's a very smart system. I think there's better ways of doing it. Uh, is there a model somewhere for a better way to do it? Well, or is there I, one I studio think, that's better no, than the other in knowing how to do it? No. I think they ha that you, there has to probably be uh, this mix. First place, most of, most of what the major studios do is they copy things. So, uh, if a film is a success, they make a copy of it. Right. They and, clone it like crazy. And they'll keep copying it until the ink, so you can't see it anymore. And when they get to that spot, then they're in trouble, and they turn around and they say, wait a minute, we, we ain't got anything to copy. <laughs> yeah. So they'll turn around and they'll find, uh, they'll find uh, some kid who's barely got a film together, uh, like this t uh, Torrentino, uh, right. uh, like uh, um, one Re Easy Rider. Yeah was made. And they'll say, that's a success, let's copy that. Or Steve that. Soderbergh who made uh, Sex Soderbergh Lives and Video Tape. Absolutely. Right. absolutely. And so as long as, and there's always these artists, they're out there, they grow like weeds. Most of them get their heads chopped off, but they keep popping up and if several of them are going to survive. Now, suppose for some reason, some miracle, on Oscar night, you are nominated as best director for the player. And you go up there and you've got to say something to the Academy. <laughs> you I would sit. turn around and look for the cameraman, look for Jean Lapine on the player, and I'd say, I thought we wrapped this picture a long time ago. <laughs> so it continues. It continues. What is it that continues? Well, it, it, it's the, kind of silly, isn't it? The, I mean, it's kind of... Uh, you make fun of them and then they give you awards. Uh, well, yes, but I mean, it's not... It's just the whole thing is a little bit surreal <laughs> to me. But is there a tiny little bit of you that, that just... Oh, wouldn't it be sweet? Oh, if it, it, it would be wonderful. Uh, I mean, there's no way I can escape from the, uh, you know, I mean, when people start yeah. saying nice things about you, you suddenly like them, don't you? <laughs> yes. Pleasure to have you here. I should say that the play was re-released on December 25th uh, because of all the attention, because it's the story lives. Now. Yeah. But no, and it's done, done well. Well, we were out, you know, for... Um, uh, we went out early in the summer, and, and we've got a re-release, and it's doing well. Okay, and attracting attention, as I said. Uh, Shortcuts is being edited now? Yeah. Now, are you getting a lot of scripts? Are people now... I'm getting... Are they returning oh, your yeah. phone calls, and they're saying, Well, I don't Bob make back. many phone Bob calls. Bob is but, back. But I, well, there's a lot of that. There there's is. A lot of that. I'm getting a lot of... Uh, I get a lot of scripts. But the, the trouble is most of the scripts I get are from people who think now I'll be able to help them get their picture made. <laughs> and uh, nobody's calling me up and giving me a check. <laughs> well, good the, luck. That's the same old fight. Pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Robert Altman. We'll be right back. James Levine is here. You know him. Robert Altman is an opera lover himself. James Levine, you know, as the artistic director of the Metropolitan Opera. We'll talk about music when we return. Stay with us.